night, saying the goal is to disarm Iraq and free its Iraqi ground fire. It's finally launched a strike the US against Iraq, taking by Iraq site and one just south of the seaport of city of Basra. As a journalist, I became fascinated with solving a mystery about my grandfather and discovering about a strange affair which had been hidden for more than a century. My grandfather, Henry Coburn, was appointed an acting minister in Korea in 1905, but retired very suddenly in 1908, retiring just at the moment when he could have expected to enjoy high rank. Why this happened is explained by the tangled history of Britain's diplomatic relations with Korea, which opened 130 years ago. Ceremonies marking the 130th anniversary of the Korea-UK diplomatic relations are taking place in both Korea and the United Kingdom. But do they really know about the tumultuous events that had happened since 1883, before Korea and the United Kingdom became such close friends today? I didn't know, actually. I don't know too much about the history of, of that story. I think it's great. I think. Um, I hope there'll continue to be a good relationship between the countries. <laughs> I did not know much about it myself until I discovered the strange story of my grandfather, Henry Coburn, and his years as senior British diplomat in Korea. But what really compelled him to retire? I wanted to find out the truth by looking into my grandfather's assignment in Korea. This is the National Archives, where old diplomatic records and government files are kept. Where shall I begin? Patrick Coburn. Uh, Patrick Coburn, yes. Do anything on me? Okay. Can you move those two out? What they I was looking at some old MI5 security files when it crossed my mind that it might be interesting to look at the Foreign Office papers marked Korea for the relevant period to see if they contained any clue as to what happened. One of the first papers I found in Q is the transcript of a telegram entitled Rendition of Korean from Henry Coburn to Sir Claude MacDonald, the British ambassador in Tokyo, warning that if it became known that we had handed over a prisoner to the Japanese and that he had subsequently been subject to conditions similar to those which obtained in the case of Yang, the worst impression would be created. My grandfather's telegram was part of an increasingly angry debate within the British Foreign Office. The British had their own imperial prestige to consider and could not allow the Japanese to have everything their own way but it wasn't easy to make a decision that could jeopardize the British-Japanese alliance over a single torture victim. In the end, Henry was ordered to hand over Yang to the Japanese, but he could not accept this and left Korea within days. Just who was this Yang Ki Tak, a man on whom my grandfather staked his career? Okay, you have your stuff. Uh, you're going incredibly early. Well, it's such a long way to Korea that uh, I don't want to miss the plane, so I'd prefer to wait at the airport. Fair enough. Well, I did say 10.30. Mm. Right, okay. Well, goodbye. Okay, okay. darling. Oh. Well, have a great time. Why did he do it? Why did my grandfather put his career on the line for a total stranger? When Henry came to Korea in 1905, he may not have realized he was arriving at a turning point in the history of the country.
As Henry took over as acting minister, Japan was beginning to end Korea's independence. Not surprisingly, Koreans resisted, and those who tried to drive out the Japanese occupational forces were massacred by Japanese troops. At the time, there were consulates of the United States, the British Empire, Germany, France, Russia, and Belgium in Seoul. But none had protested against Japan's ill treatment of Koreans. Even before Japan forced upon Korea a treaty turning Korea into a Japanese protectorate in 1905, both the United States and the British Empire had recognized Japan's control over Korea by concluding the secret Taft Katsura Agreement and the second UK-Japan Alliance Pact. The Treaty of Portsmouth, a peace treaty that ended the Russia-Japanese War and by which Russia sanctioned Japan's absolute influence over Korea. My grandfather described Korea in his report to Foreign Minister Lord Lansdowne in London as a pawn in a game of chess that has been the centre of interest solely by reason of its position relative to the pieces of the great powers. I find it strange that my grandfather's efforts to save Yang Ki Tak should lead me to meet his granddaughter over 100 years later. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I hope you did not have to wait long. Oh, not, not that long. Professor Yang Jun Jia, the granddaughter of Yang Ki Tak. father left his job, he resigned yeah, yeah. because of this business with your grandfather and because he was forced to hand him uh, over to the Japanese. So he resigned immediately from yeah. the foreign office. Fine. My organization is very unique organization. What happened is uh, we are Association for Korean Independent Patrols. During Japanese occupation, sure. we had uh, patrols who fought against Japan sure. for independence, yeah. and also the descendants like me and my wife. These are documents I got from the National Archives in Kew in London. Your grandfather was was very ill, but there wasn't enough oxygen in the cell with all these people. He was, he was in very bad condition. Yeah, and the, the, the room was too small to stand up. Then my grandfather went to the Japanese resident, who was the Japanese official, in control and complained. Thank you so much, you know, I cannot express you know, your effort. My father knew that his father had resigned from the Foreign Office at the age of 49 because he opposed Britain, British support for the Japanese occupation of Korea. Yes. But he didn't know the exact reason. My father was a very small boy. Oh, Henry Cole. My grandfather, Henry Coburn, received a strange letter only 10 days after he had arrived in Korea. It was a will written by Min Yong Hwan, a high-ranking officer in King Gojun's court. Having committed suicide as an act of final resistance against Japan, in the letter Min pleaded with the British to help Korea protect its independence against Japan's colonial ambition. Min Yong Hwan was the first Korean to travel around the world. When he visited Great Britain in 1896, he wrote his impressions of the country as this is a tranquil world. The country is peaceful and its people are comfortable. 
palaces, museums, schools, interesting sites, and old historical sites here are the best among all the countries. I'm sorry that I cannot see them all due to my tight schedule. It is evident that even over a very short visit, Min had gained very favorable impressions about Great Britain. A solemn funeral procession brought countless Koreans to mourn the tragic death of the 44-year-old Min. The funeral may have compelled Henry to ponder what the future held for Korea, Great Britain and himself. The also protracted treaty of 1905 had shamed Min Yong Wan into taking his own life. It negatively affected Henry Coburn as well, if not as tragically as Min. He ended up being demoted from acting minister to consul general. Henry was prepared to accept that the Japanese empire worked like the British empire. He did not object to empires in principle but he was not prepared to allow the Japanese to torture a man to death or keep him in conditions likely to kill him without doing everything he could to stop them. <laughs> For the past 40 years, Professor Chong Chin Sok has been studying Korean contemporary history between 1904 and 1910 which approximately coincides with my grandfather's tenure in Korea. You see that the protectorate treaty mm. from to Japan to Korea, so mm. the, all the diplomatic legations are retreat from Seoul. Okay. Only the consulate um, sure, yeah. Yeah, is remain there. So mm -hmm. your grandfather came to the charge of the affair and he must change his position. He doesn't want to reluctantly do it. Obviously, Henry was upset yeah. by having to deal with more junior yeah. Japanese officials. Yeah. Henry must accept sure, the, yeah. Yeah, the situation. After that, um, the Bessel case and the uh, Yang Gita mm. case was a cause first trial mm. to Bessel. Mm. He only, um, in, in his mind, he is the Bessel's side. Ernest Thomas Bethel came to Korea as a correspondent for the Daily Chronicle in 1904, when the Russo-Japanese War erupted. As soon as Bethel arrived in Korea, he filed an exclusive entitled Korean Emperor's Palace in B Ruins. This article made the top of the fifth page of the Daily Chronicles. As soon as Bethel arrived in Korea, he filed an exclusive entitled Korean Emperor's Palace in B Ruins. This article made the top of the fifth page of the Daily Chronicles, April 16th the Chronicle, after the article was published. Bethel later told foreign journalism in Korea about the incident, claiming that he was instructed by the Daily Chronicle to write his article in line with the Chronicle's pro-Japanese policy. But when he saw Korea's situation, he could not in good conscience blindly follow the paper's instructions. So he tendered his resignation as correspondent and the Chronicle fired him. After he was laid off from the Daily Chronicle, Bethel founded on July 18, 1904, Dehan Mail Shinbul and the Korean Daily News. With Korean journalists and independence activists, Yang Ki Tak. Park on Shik and Shin Che Ho. Bethel served as publisher and editor, Yang as editor-in-chief and operation manager, and Park and Shin as editorial writers. They denounced the Japanese imperial government for trying to colonize Korea. After launching Daihan Mail Shimbo, Bethel brought his wife Marie and young son to Korea. 
I wonder if I would have brought my family over. Even though Korea was under harsh Japanese rule, he wanted to settle down in Korea with his family. All the buildings are around here. There is the Korea Daily News building. They moved three times. The first time over one or two kilometers from here. Second time here. It was the most uh, important period that sure. they was here. This is the royal palace here. Yeah, royal palace there. Yes. Kojong's place. From here, vessel sees that uh, over there, and the uh, Korean old um, army killed by the Japanese armies. So mm -hmm. he, he saw there around the, over there. Korea Daily News vessel wrote about the story. On August 1st, 1907, armed forces of the Great Korean Empire were forcefully disbanded by the Japanese imperial government. Korean soldiers resisting the breakup were massacred by the Japanese army. Bethel witnessed the bloodbath from the Daehan Male Shinbo building, across from the Tokso Palace. He condemned the ruthlessness of the Japanese army through the Korea Daily News and Daehan Male Shinbo articles, triggering nationwide anti-Japanese movements by Korean civilian forces. The first Japanese resident general to Korea, Prince Ito Hirobumi, reportedly lamented that one line from a newspaper article turned out to be more powerful than hundreds of Ito's own words. Japan then asked the British government to deport Bethel to shut down his newspaper. If the British government could not punish Bethel effectively, Japan would have no other recourse than to bar Bethel from selling the papers or to handle it as a police matter. In the wake of Japan's threats, the British government decided to handle the Bethel matter as according to British laws. If Britain allowed Japan to deport Bethel, it would be tantamount to voluntarily giving up its extraterritorial rights in Korea. So, British Foreign Minister Sir Edward Grey ordered the British ambassador to Japan, Sir Claude MacDonald, to indict Bethel immediately. Henry Coburn, who was demoted to Consul General from Acting Minister following Korea's loss of diplomatic rights, had to speed along Bethel's trial. It was once the British legation in Korea that the name was changed to the Consul General when Korea's diplomatic rights were wrested away by Japan. A little more than a century later, the British Embassy building still stands on the same spot. The building was built in 1890, after Korea and Britain had formed diplomatic ties. Did he foresee the trouble that was about to engulf him? How conscious are Koreans of sort of past connections with well, we've got a very close political relationship uh, between the United Kingdom and Korea. We're working very closely together on the United Nations Security Council. We have peacekeepers around the world who are working together. Uh, we work very closely together on issues like uh, develop international development and climate change. So across a broad range of interests, Korea and the UK, our positions are very closely aligned. What would the present day ambassador have done? if he was in the same predicament as my grandfather back then. What would I have done if I were in his shoes? Thank you very much. Bethel was tried at the consular building in Seoul. Consul General Henry Coburn presided as acting judge. During the trial, when a Japanese residency general manager named Komatsu testified, he felt the editorials of Daihan Mail Shinbo and the Korea Daily News had disturbed peace and sparked anti-Japanese sentiments among the Koreans. But Henry said that what Komatsu felt cannot be taken as evidence and that he only wanted facts. Henry sentenced Bethel to six-month probation 
and ordered him to enter into a recognizance of 300 pounds for his good behavior. Bethel had to submit to the ruling. If he had appealed, the higher court in Shanghai would have to reverse the verdict, which was very unlikely, and Bethel would have to be deported. But after Bethel's trial, Henry again found himself in a quandary. On March 21, 1908, American diplomat and one-time foreign affairs advisor to the Korean Empire, Durham White Stevens, said in a press conference in the United States that the Korean imperial family and the government are corrupt and Koreans don't deserve to gain independence because they are too stupid. Enraged by Stevens' remarks, representatives of the Korean America asked Stevens to take back his comments, but they were flatly refused. Two days later, on March 23rd, a Korean nationalist by the name of John Myung Un shot Stevens in San Francisco. But the shot misfired and the two men ended up in a scuffle. Then Jiang In Huan, John's comrade, took a shot at Stevens, killing him. This story hit the headlines of the San Francisco Chronicle and other foreign media and the United Korean, a Korean-American newspaper, called John and Jiang patriotic heroes for shooting Stevens. The Japanese supreme authority in Korea, Prince Ito Hirobumi, requested Sir Claude MacDonald that the British deal with Bethel, claiming that his newspaper had incited Stevens' assassination and was thus partly responsible for his death. It was, in essence, an official complaint over Henry Coburn's verdict on Bethel. Henry was in an awkward spot. To make matters worse, Daihan Mail Shinbo resumed its scathing anti-Japanese attacks. Bethel was tried at the Consular building in Seoul. He was accused of publishing the article with intent to incite unrest and disorder and hostility between the Korean government and its people. This was where Henry first saw journalist Yang Ki Tuck, a witness for the defense. Fearing Japan's retribution, everyone was frightened of testifying as a witness for Bethel, but not Yang Ki Tuck. My grandfather Henry was outraged that Yang, who had the courage to testify, should then be arrested by the Japanese. The three-day trial ended with Bethel being convicted for a first-class misdemeanor and sentenced to three weeks in prison. Bethel left Korea on a British naval vessel headed for the British consular jail in Shanghai. On the day that Bethel was to return to Seoul, after serving his three-week imprisonment in Shanghai, the editor-in-chief Yang Ki Tak was arrested. Upon hearing the news of Yang's arrest, Henry promptly asked the Japanese residency general for Yang's release. Henry protested that the arrest was nothing but Japan's retaliation for Yang's testimony in Bethel's trial and was in violation of Article 3 of the British-Japan Alliance. Soedemun Prison History Hall. This prison was built by the Japanese in October 1908. It was where Koreans resisting Japan's colonial rule were incarcerated. Diane Mail Shinmo's successor, Alfred Marnum, visited Yang in prison. Marnum wrote a letter describing Yang's grim condition to Henry Coburn. He said, I have this afternoon been to see Mr. Yang Ki Tak at the jail. He is worn to a skeleton, being practically only skin and bone. He is a nervous wreck, is afraid to talk, and looks on the verge of a collapse.
I learned that he, in company with 19 other men, is confined day and night in one small room, 14 feet by 12 feet. It is killing him by degrees. Henry Coburn immediately wired British Foreign Minister Sir Edward Grey to tell of Yang's rapidly deteriorating health. Grey promptly telegraphed Ambassador MacDonald to demand the Japanese government allow medical treatment for Yang. MacDonald sent a letter on behalf of the British Foreign Office to Prince Ito, the Japanese Residency General in Korea. Concerned that Yang would cause a diplomatic rift between Japan and Great Britain, Ito ordered Yang to be quickly admitted to a hospital. But a Japanese prison guard mistakenly told Yang that he was free and released him onto the street. Yang then promptly fled to the Daihan Mail Shinbo office. Secretary Mura of the Japanese Residency General demanded Henry Coburn hand over Yang, but he refused, saying that he couldn't do so without an order from the British government. Tokyo voiced its protest to both MacDonald and Gray, arguing that Britain had no jurisdiction over Yang's arrest. In return, the British Foreign Office presented a compromise drafted by Henry Coburn. In exchange for handing Yang over to the Japanese, Japan should release him and halt the indictment. But Japan flatly refused Britain's proposal and opposed any preconditions attached to Yang's transfer. Unable to find any more excuses to deny Japan's demands, Gray sent a telegram to Coburn ordering him to hand over Yang to the Japanese if he was well enough to move about. Henry Coburn left Korea on September 15, 1908, on a train headed for Siberia. He failed to see his attempt to keep the journalists safe from the occupying forces would bear fruit. What could my grandfather have thought about on his train ride out of Korea? Did he for a moment regret offending his own government as well as Japan? Did he regret giving up his job? Probably not, since he was angered by what he saw as the failure of the British Foreign Office to support him by, against Japan. He died in 1927, long before Korea gained its independence. Bethel passed away even earlier than my grandfather. He was only 37 when he died of a heart attack on May 1st, 1909. Maybe brought on by the strain of imprisonment. Ernest Bethel, who loved Korea and staked all he had for Korea's independence. Countless Koreans came out to join the funeral procession and mourn his death. Letters mourning his death arrive from all over Korea. A man from Great Britain came to Korea to shed light into the darkness with a newspaper. His arrival was no coincidence, but I want to ask the heavens, why was his departure so sudden? Yang expressed his grief at Bethel's untimely death thus, Following Bethel's funeral, his wife Marie took her young son back to England. What she left behind in Korea was her husband's Bethel's a dream of an independent career and her hopes of, of a long life with her husband. Over here. Mm -hmm. Yang is interred in a section marked for important figures of the yes. Korean Provisional Government. Seoul National Cemetery.
Today I came to his grave site with his granddaughter. Temporary government in Shanghai. Oh, I see. Yes. No, I didn't really. He was died in China, but sure. we brought his remains. Is that when your mother and your husband went to China? Oh, 1998. My mother and my husband, they went to China mm. uh, to find out my father's remains, some pieces of bones that they brought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was his, almost 60 years mm. after he died. So mm. there were small pieces of bones oh, yeah. Yeah, they brought. Oh, 할아버지. Uh, Today, would Henry have been surprised to find Yang Ki Tak, whom he so determinedly wanted to protect, regarded as a national hero? But he would probably have been pleased this happened. They sold Shinman, the later incarnation of Dai Han male Shinbo. A bust of Yankee Tak stands here, a man who fought against the Japanese imperial reign armed only with a pen. Before Bethel died, he supposedly held onto Yang's hand and said his last words. Even if I die, let Shinbo live on forever to save the Korean people. Honoring his words, Yang kept writing scorching editorials against the Japanese imperial government until Daihan Mail Shinbo was forced to blaze shut by the Japanese on August 28, 1910. Do these people remember the three men who struggled valiantly to keep this paper alive more than a century ago? Bethel's last wish was for the paper's continued service to the Korean people. Henry Coburn certainly believed in defending the right of freedom of expression. I hope the soul Shenman keeps that spirit alive for a long time. I'm a big fan of Korean film. I think um, it's, it's a really good way that we can get to know about kind of Korean society. Korean films, like uh, you, you don't need to, you, you don't need to cut everything up. You can stretch a, a story and like get into the characters more and get into their psychology. Having started back in 2003, the London Korean Film Festival already celebrates its tenth year. From my point of view, one of the most exciting things about the London Korean Film Festival is that it gives me a chance to share some of my pleasures in Korean cinema with my friends and uh, contemporaries in London. Uh, they also have the chance to see some of these great films that I've been enjoying so much in Korea. Britons say they love Korean films for their originality and moving plots. Do they know about a man who lived a more dramatic life than those depicted in these films? Really? Wow. Well, that person was probably very brave and or her to do that. So yeah. Wow. That's pretty amazing. They're really proud about it. Especially my friends also in Korea. They also told me about this. No. <laughs> There was a man who chose to die because he loved his country so much. His name was Yi Han Ong. Yi Han Ong traveled halfway across the globe and endured months of stormy weather to arrive in London in 1904. He was a diplomat like my grandfather. 
In London, as an acting minister of Korea, he had no time to enjoy the fascinating sights of a foreign land, because he had to work frantically to save his country deep in trouble. He received news in 1905 that Japan and Great Britain were about to conclude the second bilateral agreement that said Britain recognizes Japan's rights to guide, supervise, and protect all political, economic, and military affairs and interests in Korea. He desperately asked the British government to help Korea take back its sovereignty and tried to dissuade London from concluding the treaty on the grounds of its injustice, but failed to bring this about. Despondent over this failure, he took his own life on May 12, 1905. He was only 31. This is the street in which the first Korean mission to the United Kingdom was established. It's well, not very far, in fact, from where the uh, ambassador has his residence now. But it's a rather sad street, as you know, because uh, in 1905, when the Japanese were consolidating their position in Korea, the man in charge here, Mr. Yi, uh, in protest of what was happening, committed suicide. And, and there, there is, is the very house in which they lived. I'm not sure which flat they had, but uh, there were two of them. This is where Yi Han Ong ended his life. It used to house the first Korean legation in Britain. It was a thousand years of mm. independent political... Entity. Japan had right. taken away Korea's fiscal rights by that time, leaving the Korean legation only enough financial means to rent a single room. It is now an ordinary residence. Did his day make any difference to Korea-UK relations. So, were the British paying any attention to what he was saying? It's hard to tell. It, it didn't get very much coverage. Mm. It didn't even get very much coverage in Korea. Mm. The Foreign Office sent its formal condolences and uh, reported, asked that mm. the, those condolences be passed to His Majesty the King of Korea. Although he could not stop a second treaty between Britain and Japan. His death helped launch a group of British-sponsored sympathizers to Korea's plight. The League of Friends of Korea was founded in the British Parliament in October 1920. Was his death meaningful because a pro-Korean organization was established in Britain and friendly relations between the two countries developed? Whatever happened, his death was sad and lonely. The remains of Yi Han Ong took the same long, rough sea route back to Korea. Hello. Hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. I'm meeting you. with Yi Han Ong's grandson. Hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. Oh, hi. I'm uh, Patrick Coburn. He is more than twice E's age when he died. There seems to be little resemblance, but E. Hang Ong is the grandfather who died a tragic death. Ah, oh, there he is. Yeah, yeah well, that's interesting. Yeah. And this is in London, or this is here? London, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, this was, uh, this was on the coffin. Ah. Oh. His name? E. Hang Ong. Oh, the charge of the... Died in London, mm -hmm. 12 May 1905. This is a note he left to his older brother and wife before he died. It's very moving. Why did such a family man make this choice? I wanted to ask him, was your country that dear to you?
It is very different from the present Korean embassy. Nice to meet you. How do you do? I'm doing fine. This is the statue of uh, Mr. Lee han mm. who committed suicide in 1905. British and Korean relations have generally been good, mm -hmm. but there have been moments when Britain was very interested in what's happened in Korea. How would you describe the extent of interest at the moment? Right now the relationship between the UK and Korea couldn't be better. By broad partnership they mean the relationship between our two countries uh, can cover a lot of areas from economy, trade, culture, science, technology, to diplomacy, and everything. And by creative partnership, we mean that uh, the UK and Korea can become very good partners in cultivating creative economy in both of our countries. An interesting program is underway at the Korean Cultural Center. The K-pop Academy was opened as Korean pop music became popular in the UK and the rest of the world. It's not a course for just learning Korean pop songs, but also for studying Korean culture and history. <laughs> 안녕하세요. 저는 안나 나안리입니다. I actually blog for the Korean government. I blog for Koreanet. So one of the reasons I come to the K-pop Academy is so that I can learn more about what other young British people think about Korean culture and then I cover this on my blog. I um, spoke about uh, my granddad participating in the Korean World War. So I wanted to learn more about what he was doing while out there, uh, what he was serving. Um, I also wanted to learn about like the culture and stuff. So. Up to the, other side. the program has already been going on for four years. What would Lee Han Ong have said if he saw these fans of Korean culture today? Nobody had listened when he was so frantically trying to win support for his country a hundred years ago. The British naval vessel Flying Fish entered Jamalpo port in 1882 to sign a trade treaty with Korea. When Vice Admiral Willis sailed to Korea, on board his ship was William George Aston, and he was the only person who was able to speak Korean in order to conduct any sorts of negotiations. The two sides concluded the trade deal without a problem, but the British trade representatives faced big opposition when they returned home get the pact ratified. The treaty was scrapped for having failed to represent the interests of British merchants. Although the treaty was rejected, the fateful connection built between the two countries in 1882 produced a tangible result in the following year. The bilateral trade treaty was concluded in Yonbok Palace in 1883. I'm going to see Bethel's granddaughter. There seems to be nobody here. Boing, boing. Patrick Coburn. Hello, Patrick. Hi, hi. What happened a hundred years ago in Korea has led me to a meeting with Ernest Bethel's granddaughter, Susan, and her daughters in the heart of England. Really, the first time that um, we ever knew anything about um, the way that the Koreans um, appreciated what my grandfather done for them. These medals, um, you know, that, that have been um, given uh, to my grandfather um, after his death. Um, and that's the... Uh, uh, um, I was about 12 years old. My mother, we went... So, you know, that just shows... And um, there was, there was a, a book which uh, my mother actually gave. You know, they... Um, and she was fairly bitter. Which, which anybody would be, uh, about what had happened to her husband. Uh, you know, to lose your husband at, at 36 years old when you've only been married for a few years and to have to, to bring, you know, a small child, um, as my father was only a young boy. To... Yang Tika, yeah. 
the Korean Daily News, um, the, the Korean editor, never, um, never ever forget my, forgot my grandfather um, after he died. And, and he still kept in touch with my grandmother, even after she returned to um, England. And, and here's a postcard that he, he sent. Um, and he was, you know, he was for many years um, in contact, um, you know, with, with my grandmother. A small token of gratitude is what we need in this uh, time and age. What about your uh, grandfather? Oh. Which is one more volume. Okay. To oh. To your library. Thank you very much. That's... Now that's the back. Oh. There he is. Yeah. Lovely picture. A striking picture. Yeah. It's a really good cover. Yeah. Very nice cover. No, Although a single book cannot contain all the love and dedication shown by your grandfather towards Korea, we hope the book serves as another reminder that you are a descendant of a truly great man and eases your longing for your grandfather from the Koreans who want to cherish Ernest Bethel forever in their hearts. It's just so moving um, and uh, to know that, you know, what he did was was is still today um, so looked upon um, by the uh, Korean um, descendant. That's the same picture. Yes. Okay. It is interesting to meet people whose grandfather, like mine, were involved in this strange drama in Korea over a century ago. The high times of imperialism, the turbulent era of my grandfather Henry Coburn, political radical and nationalist Yankee Tak, journalist Ernest Bethel, and diplomat Hee Han Ong, appears to have come to an end. But it is surely right that their courage should be remembered and the role it played in creating a safer and better world.